I became a grandma just over two years ago, and one of the greatest gifts of that relationship is that it's been an opportunity to recapture some of the creative energy that sort of tends to fade over the years. Plus, I'm very fortunate to say that my grandson is a superhero. In the blink of an eye, or rather, the change of a mask, he can become Captain America. Cyborg, Iron Man, or Thor. And when he's in character, everyone takes a role. Check out the package his great-grandpa sent him. To Captain America, from the Batcave. There's something about this little fella that draws us into his story. And I think it's because like every great leader, he knows his powers, and he lives his purpose. And depending upon his preference, selects the tools that he needs to save the day. And it got me to thinking, when I first started teaching, I felt like a superhero. Now, I'm a technology instructional specialist in a K-12 school system, and I support teachers using technology to both drive and deliver instruction. Now, I've always been somewhat technically inclined. When I was a little girl, I loved to play with new gadgets, gizmos, anything that I could get my hands on. But that enthusiasm found a cause in 1995, the first time I heard the term, the digital divide. The gap between the technology haves and have-nots. Back then, it was defined as access to multimedia computers and the internet. Today, it includes access to high quality resources, the caliber of the curriculum and instruction you receive, as well as whether or not you are a tech consumer or tech producer. Back in that course, I read every single suggested title that was on the syllabus. And I began to think of ways that I could somehow make a difference. The future of education looked bright and exciting. People would be able to connect in new ways. The greatest minds could meld and solve the world's problems. And it was at that point that I put on my cape and I started focusing my energy on a new cause. Bridging the digital divide one bite <laughs> at a time. <laughs> There's nothing like seeing people reach their potential. And with me forging the way, we were going to leap tall buildings in a single click. Now, you know it didn't happen that way. One of the, the, one of the realizations that I came to quickly was that not all children love technology in the ways that I had assumed. And the irony is we always refer to children as digital natives, born into a world rich with resources. But that does not mean that they're going to automatically become empowered through the use of technology. They love the games, they love the novelty, but very few were really interested in the life-altering activities that somehow I had deluded myself into believing that they would embrace. And as a teacher, it bothers me because I know that technology permeates all areas of our lives. It allows us to learn new things, control our message, make needed change, and feed our family. And without a few key set of skills, it has the ability to take all of that away. And sadly, as students go throughout school, they turn away from it, often out of fear, perception of geeks, and a misguided belief that they have nothing to contribute. So, I went on a mission determined to find the key traits of the tech-savvy student and to see whether or not that information could be used to help encourage more students to pursue technology courses once they left middle school. Using a combination of state tests, temperament assessments, 
open-ended items, and skills self-assessments, it became apparent that there were generally four overarching approaches to technology that varied by use, performance, activity, and also by computational thinking standards. Now, using one of the open-ended questions, which was, let me make sure I got this accurate, what are some of your favorite cube computer activities in school and at home, and why do you like them? I created word clouds for each type. Now, as I share these with you, I want you to keep in mind, these were 13-year-old students, most of them were in eighth grade, and I'd like for you to follow the fun. The first type, communicators. I have a quote from each one, and I'll share, you the, share with you the communicator quote here. At home, I generally steer towards social networking sites. At school, I tend to take advantage of listening to music from a flash drive that I supply to help myself focus on work. For your kind, tender-hearted, and empathetic students, humans were their technology. When they used devices, they tended to focus on social networking and blogging and other activities that allowed them to connect with people. The communicator measure also had the highest correlation between temperament and a preference for web design. Now think about it. If you remember what websites used to look like, ideally they need to be user-friendly. Communicators are people who naturally consider people throughout the creative process, and they make excellent designers. They bring beauty and accessibility to technology. Without them, we would still be looking at 8-bit pixelated graphics and using tags to format essays. And for those of you who don't know what that is, thank the communicators. <laughs> the next one up, organizers. What's the second largest word after games? What was that? Work. work. These are 13-year-old kids. They're like 40-year-olds. <laughs> for the organizers, technology was a work tool. I've got a quote for you. I usually like to make spreadsheets, PowerPoint, and different documents for groups I am in, such as junior beta or schoolwork. After that, I like to look on Pinterest or Instagram for different ideas to do, such as artwork or organizing my room better. Now, for this group, they gain the most from traditional instruction, and in particular, in the business applications course. As a group, they had an advantage over their peers in that they were the most likely to complete all assignments. And that characteristic is also likely why the organizer measure was a secondary indicator of success on the state test. Third group, presenter gamers. Facebook, Prezi, Microsoft Word, Skype, Pinterest, etc. Prezi and Microsoft Word make doing schoolwork easier and more fun. Facebook, Skype, and Pinterest are great social media websites. Presenter gamers use technology to make an impact. They listed more multimedia, visual, visual design, and presentation applications than any other type. Now, like their peers, they take their offline pre uh, preferences with them when they go online. They're the novelty seekers. They love change, and this gives them the ability to be open to new possibilities. Last but not least, we have the analyzers. What's the largest word? Fun. Fun, exactly. Yeah, the analyzers, for that group, everything about technology was fun. And the geek speak in their open-ended items was loud and clear. Terraria, a popular indie game for PC because it is a very interesting game. Creating mods for said game and programming in general. I also enjoy playing with friends, the few that I have. <laughs> <laughs> the analyzers were the ultimate tech masters. Not only did they use computers more than their peers, they listed the most unique 
and complex activities such as networking and programming. And they also enjoyed the multi-role uh, multi user, multi-user role-playing games and listed many of those by name. They considered themselves as fact finders who were determined and loved a challenge. Now, not only did they perform the highest on the technology test, many of the other characteristics that were apparent in the open-ended items indicated that they possessed many of the traits of the computer scientist. So, what can we do with this? You see what I see? Tech superpowers. I see four new costumes for my grandson. The analyzer, I know what to do. The organizer, I get it done. The communicator, I take care of people. And the presenter gamer, I make things fun. And fun is obviously a key to mastering technology. What, you know, today's topic is connecting creatively. What if we approach technology in a way that allowed things to be a little bit more adventurous? What if we taught students to assess their powers, their preferences, and their purpose so that they could save the day? Think of the implications for education. We could pair students up on the opposite ends of the technology spectrum so that they can complement each other's skills. For example, analyzers are likely to be computer savvy, but they're also likely to lack the interpersonal skills of a communicator. You pair those students up on a web design activity. You allow one to learn more about coding and the other to understand about design. Your presenter gamers and your organizers have opposite approaches to completing assignments. Pairing, the, excuse me, pairing them in an activity would allow them to explore technology creatively, but also make sure that the work gets done. And when you have larger projects, find a way to incorporate all types. Successful cooperative grouping fosters positive interdependence but also incorporates a sense of individual accountability. And that's something that could be gained when we allow students to self-assess and share and communicate their preferences, their powers, and their purpose. When it comes to technology, there are many superheroes. We simply need to help them access those preferences, powers, and purpose, whether they know what to do, get things done, take care of people, or make things fun. If, they have, if they're able to harness those things, they too can help bridge the digital divide. Thank you. Mm. <laughs>